It's a fabulous Friday morning here on Whispering Hope. And in our midst today, we have our own pastor, Sabbath School Director of the Salt Leeward Conference, Pastor Orville Joseph, in the house to help us discuss this wonderful lesson. Now, this week, we've been looking at the topic, A Life of Praise. And so we know it promises to be great as we get all excited to discuss God's words. I am your host, Sister Mikita Challenger. But before we jump into all of these wonderful questions and discussions, as we discuss a life of praise, we're going to ask Pastor Joseph just to pray to invite God's presence here among us. Let us pray, gracious God and our Heavenly Father, we come this morning again to give you praise and to exalt your most holy name because you're worthy. We come also to seek your guidance as we enter into your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit will direct our thoughts, uh, give us understanding, and we pray that whatever we share today will be a blessing to others. Uh, this morning as well, we want to pray for all those who are viewing. We pray that your Holy Spirit will come upon them. We pray that you will protect them, guide God, shield them, that you will bless them with copious blessings that they, they cannot contain. And we pray, kind Father, that they will be prosperous, that they will be strong, they will be healthy, that you'll protect their children, that you'll secure their borders, and that in the end, your name will be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So again, every week, Pastor Joseph, they leave the questions for you to answer. And so I think today from our viewers, we have about four questions. And so the right man to ask these questions is clearly our Sabbath School Director. And so question number one for you, Pastor Joseph. Is there a link between faith and praise? If so, is it a direct or indirect one? Was Israel shouting the full expression of faith in God? and his promises to see them through? What's your take? Uh, certainly, I would say that there is a link, a direct link between faith and praise. Faith draws from God a response to our longings, our yearnings, our desires, and we celebrate God's response, even as Hebrews again say in Hebrews 11, 1, even before we hold it tangible by faith, we embrace it and we express our praise, our thanksgiving to a God who has been gracious and loving and kind. Anyone who expresses faith in Jesus Christ have a reason to rejoice. Anyone who sees Christ responding to their faith have a reason to rejoice. And so that, for me, is a, a direct connection between our faith and our praise. That's a direct connection between praise and our faith. All right. So thank you. Question number two. Have you ever noticed that for every praiseworthy thing, there seems to be a hundred things to complain about? How does praise win the victory in such situations? God prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Uh, God seemed to call us to rejoice when it seems that our, uh, our enemies are very, very present before us, very active against us. And, and when I say enemy, I'm talking about circumstances that are there to test us, to try us, to bring us down, to, to test us. And whatever those circumstances are, you have a table spread before you, a moment of praise and exaltation, a moment of thanksgiving, an expression of God's goodness and, and triumph and victory in your life. Yes, for every trial that you have, there is a possibility and an occasion for you to lament, to complain, to boss, and to, uh, to grumble, to find all kinds of negative reaction. But those very, those very situations are opportunities for you to praise a God that has blessed you in a way 
that he has presented to you circumstances that would allow you to deepen your faith, to sharpen your focus on him, to cement your hope. You know, when, I think last week and the week before, we study about what the crucible does for our, for our hope and for our faith, you know, so that things that we see that would have pressed us down are things that we should look at as a reason to hope as a reason to exercise even deeper faith. And this week again, the lesson is saying, listen, the things that you see that you probably grow despondent about are reasons for you to give praise to God um, because God is still uh, a covenant keeping God. God is still a promise keeping God. God is still your friend and provider and protector. Well, that's really a mouthful, and you have touched on our third question, coming from somebody who is talking about debt. Now you've lost a loved one, somebody close to you has died. Would you praise the Lord the same way? You know, sometimes when you face a situation like debt, loss of a loved one, it is difficult for you to be able to say in everything, give praise and give thanks. Nonetheless, if, if you trust a God that works things out in a way that, that is for the benefit of his children, for the benefit of those who trust in him, then even in the midst of death, you can find a reason to <laughs> praise God. Now, now I, I want to caution people that, you know, you don't just go up to somebody who has lost a loved one and say, well, give God thanks and be praised. Uh, no, be ever present with that person to provide support. Uh, understand that there is, in the process of loss, there, there is a human reaction of grieving and you spend time and, and, and so on. But don't take that for an opportunity to blame God and to say why God should do this or why God should do that or, or say to that person, hey, listen, you know, you say you're a Christian. Why do you keep serving God even in the midst of death? Use it for an opportunity to deepen your faith in God. And in your moment of, of solitude, give God thanks for his wisdom and even though you're unable to see it and understand it, you know that he has acted well and in your best interest. And so you praise him and thank him. You know, if I may add, sometimes in debt, depending on what the person may be dying from, you may be relieved that the person has passed on. And particularly, I speak of cancer. I remember in the last few months of my brother's life, he was in so much pain. And when he was groaning and in all this pain, sometimes you yourself felt the pain emotionally. And you wish the pain would go away. And so when the person died, not that you're happy that they're dead, but you are happy that no more pain. And so rough situation, death is never easy. And as Pastor Joseph rightly said, you know, we can't tell somebody, but well, praise the Lord, the man dead, you know, that comes across as being really insensitive. But God knows best, and sometimes it's really difficult to trust him in the trying scenes of our life. And so, Pastor Joseph, there's one more question for you. One more question. And it says, so how often... Do we praise God for an overbearing boss, a terminated employment contract, an aborted lucrative business deal, an unsafe spouse, complaining saints, or ungrateful neighbors? Are these things we're supposed to praise God for? You're the pastor, tell me. How often? Always, always. I think we have learned in this quarter's lesson that God allows things to come our way, situations to come into our life, to deepen our relationship with him, to strengthen our resolve, to, to strengthen our faith and commitment, to create greater assurance and confidence in us. That, that There's so many things positive things that come out of our encounter with struggles. I think somebody put it that way, you know, it is by lifting up the weight 
in the gym, that your muscles are made strong. Uh, yes, it causes pain, but as you continue to lift those iron, you, you see your muscle begin to develop and strengthen and become firm and strong. It is the same way that that overbearing boss, that loss of what you think is your gym drop, you know, those circumstances that come in your life uh, have been aborted because God wants to do something amazingly wonderful and tremendous in your life. And that is why, you know, you got to just, just trust him and praise him and say, thank you, Jesus. So just don't ever stop giving God thanks for the situation that he has placed in your life. Sometimes that boss will turn around and say, boy, I did you so many things. And yet still, you're still respectful. You're still humble. You're still uncomplaining. Those are the kind of things. And, and it strengthens you and make you even better position to be able to lead others in the future. They always say that people who work well with others make the best boss, but people who are always contentious with others certainly cannot be a not good leadership material. But it shows that God designed situations just to put us in a position of strength. What about this in? What if your boss is a Seventh-day Adventist and they're treating you real terribly? <laughs> All of the even the more reason to praise even the more yeah, reason to praise all of the same household of faith he's studying the same lesson I study and he's treating me horribly on the job are you saying Pastor Joseph that I am supposed to praise uh, God again if you see every trial if you see every difficulty if you see every pain every temptation as an opportunity that God is giving you to grow, develop become strong become firm and committed and to deepen your relationship with him. Whether it comes from the person sitting next to you in the pew, you know, you just got to give God thanks. David said one time that it is, it is the person that I walk with ch to church with that turned out to be the one that was actually stabbing me uh, and so on. So even in the midst of those situations, you give God thanks. All right. Well, thank you so very much. I just had to throw that one in because I've heard a few complaints from members that sometimes their bosses and their supervisors are of the same faith. You expect better and, you know, but anyway, that's for a whole different discussion. So we yeah. jump into Friday's question. And, you know, as usual, we have to go to our memory text. And you, as usual, you have to give me your take on it. And our memory text for this week comes from Philippians 4.4. 4. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Pastor Joseph, what's your take on our memory text? The, the Apostle Paul encourages us to rejoice in the Lord always. And he emphasizes it by saying, again, I say rejoice. I mean, when, when I hear the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Philippi, saying to them rejoice, it is interesting because... This is one of the prison epistles. This is one of the epistles that was written in prison. And here is somebody who is incarcerated saying to people who are free, rejoice in the Lord. Find a reason to rejoice. I mean, you have your freedom, but you're not in chains or bond. But, uh, but here I am and I'm saying to you, hey, rejoice in the lord always so whatever your circumstances whatever it is that you're going through whatever whatever it is that you have encountered the challenges that you're meeting in life it is difficult it's painful sometimes but rejoice in the lord always always give god praise because there's an amazing thing about praise whenever you praise god it lifts your burden. It makes them seem so light and trivial. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, sometimes you even forget them and get lost in your moment of praise. And so that is, I think, is what the Apostle Paul is encouraging. Just get excited about God. Again, I say to you, just get excited because when you do so, your pain seems to be diminished. I, I want to suggest that the, one of the best painkillers would be, you know, just a, a moment of praise. 
You know, and I've seen people who have been given painkillers and, and it doesn't seem to be working. But when they turn around and begin to sing, you know, life is just so amazing. And, and so I just say to people, just rejoice in the Lord always. Amen. So we jump to a question on Friday's lesson. And we're talking about praise in the life of a Christian. And so what role does community praise, going to church praise, not staying at home praise, have in the life of a Christian? I think praise in the community is a powerful, um, is a powerful thing for the community. It shows that um, whenever we pray, I don't know if you have experienced it, but when you go to church, especially they say we only do this during crusade time, but when, when those songs begin to roll and those choristers are moving, you know, from one song to another, and you get carried away in the praise and the, and the glorification of God, you seem so excited. Everything, your focus, you have lost focus on anything else outside of the praise experience. And that is what community praise does. I'm saying community praise helps to lift your burden as well. When you come together as a community and you praise God, the burden that you've been carrying all week, the things that were weighing you down, the things that you think you could not overcome or, or you came to church feeling so sad about, it, it, they seem to dissipate. Uh, you know, that's what community praise does. Communicate has a way of breaking those strongholds. And uh, one beautiful thing about people sometimes when they are affected directly by by the enemy in a spiritual experience just put them into a moment of praise where people begin to sing and praise god and see how much the enemy is humbled humiliated and exposed by that experience and even flee as a result so within the context of community praise in god ser serves as a powerful source of strengthening a person's faith commitment and fervor and allows that person to experience a high level a high degree of euphoria a, a sense of not being able to recognize and appreciate the pain that they're going through at the moment in time Amen. So, second question. How do you describe the praise in your Sabbath service? Is it uplifting? Does it encourage members to maintain faithfulness amid trials and traumas? If not, what can be done? As I said, community praise is amazing, it's powerful. But I, I must say that in recent times, what we refer to now as the praise time has been given over to a selected few. Perhaps the church hasn't catch on to it because we have not told them to or encouraged them to. But that time that's referred to by some people as praise and worship time when that, pray, that team of song leaders are leading the church in singing, that's a time when the congregation itself should get involved in singing and praising as well, rather than just sitting down and listening as, as if it is an item of special music. And I'm saying that if as a church we get involved in that, it makes so much of a difference. We see the difference that it makes under the tent, but we have still have a challenge in some churches transferring it to the sanctuary. And we need to be able to have an appreciation of praising God. There was a section that I read in our study guide, I think it's a quotation from Ellen White, that praise is as important as prayer, or the emphasis of praise should be there as much as the emphasis of prayer. So sometimes that's something that we need to put an emphasis on. I know sometimes we think a lot of singing, Pentecostal, that kind of thing. But hey, listen, praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Anyhow, I'm never going to let my troubles get me down. That's got to be an attitude when we come to service. Make praise uplifting and powerful so that it helps to ease the burden and, and pressures of life of the worshipers. I have to add my piece in. You know that I am musically inclined and... There are lots of times that sometimes you go to church and the praise and worship session, I'm not talking about the team now, I talk about the people who go up and there's no planning at all as it relates to leading God's people into worship. They just pull a song, there's no practice, and to me, it does a disservice to the worship. The minister prepares the word to 
give to the congregation. And I think we need to get to the place where the worship experience is meaningful and planned. Not somebody go up and say, can we get a favorite number from somebody in the audience? <laughs> Come on. It's for me, it, it's the highlight of a service, maybe because I'm musically inclined. So when I go to a church and the worship, now don't talk about the singing, because you have a point, Pastor Joe, that there's some congregation where the worship team takes over and it's all about them. But what I mean when I say true worship, when everybody is involved, when you can lead people to see Jesus, it's the only part of the worship except the giving of tithes and offering where everybody participates and that's in the singing and i think as a church we have to pay a little bit more attention to the quality of praise we give to god i have friends um, who who play and who are involved in the sunday worship sunday church worship and they spend hours agree that a lot of their songs are pentecostal but the point i'm trying to make is that they give praise priority in making sure that the voices are in tune and there's harmony between the vocals and the musicians go ahead so you want to say no you're correct there's some things in our worship that we don't want to plan we don't want to plan our prayers we just want to come and and speak out of our head and ellen white says that we ought to plan our prayers you know we ought to know exactly what we and so it is with our praise time as well and the songs have various themes and so it, it's good to link songs with the similar themes together. Also, there are songs where you want to elicit a certain kind of response from people. And the hymnal does allocate songs in categories to help people. Some people choose songs for a lively praise time that's designed for mourning and, and all that kind of thing <laughs> and so on. And so we need to pay attention to those things when we take a talk about praise. Just wanted to put that in. Put that in. Thank you so very much. Somebody's saying the same thing I'm saying. So we go to our next question. What does it mean to praise the Lord even when you fall into darkness or to praise him even in temptation? And the follow-up question, how can praise help us through these situations? Again, we, we see the example of Jericho, where the emphasis in the struggle was placed on God. The emphasis was placed on he who has all the power to do anything about the problem that we have. And so we see the praising of God, the praising of the daily, the daily praising of God, the daily lifting up of God, the, the daily recognition of God, and then the, the moment of celebration that brings everything to a climax as God demonstrates the, his power and awe in protecting his people. And so whenever you're going through difficulties and trials and temptation, use that and my parents, my parents and others in the church that I grew up in use this very effectively whenever they, they feel that they're overwhelmed with a situation or they're tempted beyond measure, they begin to sing. And that in itself, you know, quiet them, in, that in itself takes them away from the focus of the temptation that they're facing and turn their eyes upon Jesus. And that I think is, is the power of praise in praising God. When you praise God, as I said before, the pain, the anguish, the difficulties, the frustration that's overwhelming you seem to flee. And that is the power. So praise God, I, I would say to a person, even in your darkest moment, because it brings some degree of light and satisfaction. I want to add an experience here. I remember I was in a meeting this year, maybe towards the beginning of the year with my principal. A pastor Judy, she was saying some things that were not kind. And everything inside of me ready to answer her. And then the spirit just started to say to me, sing in your mind. And I just started to rock and sing in my mind. I didn't hear nothing else she said. And it was able to help us to end on an amicable note. Because if I didn't begin to sing, I probably wouldn't have a job. And so, praise yes, God. even when you're tempted, you recognize that praising God in that situation can do so much more for you. And I just wanted to throw that in that, you know, sometimes you get yourself in some trying situations and praising your way out is the best answer to that problem. So... Question for you. How has praise affected your life? 
and what can you learn from this experience? I would say for, for me personally as well, and some of the things that I'm saying is that when you feel overwhelmed, when you feel that things aren't going the way you would like them to go, when it, it seems as if you, you're going under or you're already under and somebody's holding you down on the water and you need to breathe, singing a song. For the week, I've been singing some Joseph Niles. I mean, yeah, you got to give us a tune. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you, know, you know, you feel like singing sometimes. You just feel like singing some Jim Reeves, those songs and so on. There are moments in your life when it seems as if only singing or praising or exalting God or going to a song, those are the only things that, that your mind tells you that, hey, listen, you do them, you're going to be all right. And they always work. Amen. 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 Now, Pastor Joseph, last question. You have to have a psalm of praise. What is it? And what does it teach you about praise? And what impact does it have on your life and your faith? What is your praise psalm? And what does it teach you about praise? And how does it affect your faith and your life? Let's go. You're smiling. Don't tell me you have all the psalms. Oh, what am I praying, Psalm? Is Psalm 103? Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul, um, and forget not all his benefits, who um, forgives all of your iniquities, who oh, heals all your diseases, who redeem your life from destruction. And that, that's one of the Psalms that I love to go to whenever, you know, I, I need to repeat a Psalm. Uh, another yes, Psalm, that I, Psalm 107. Is, no, no, I'm surprised you didn't tell me Psalm 23. Because every time we are here and we have some kind of discussion, you find some way to work. I like I like Psalm 103. I like Psalm 107. I, I like Psalm 24. Um, I, I like Psalm 27. Uh, I, I like Psalm 34. Those are good Psalm, you know, that I like to that I like to go to. Psalm 116 as well. You know, it, it is a Psalm. David finds himself in some challenge, but at least it has some good verses there that brings turn your mind towards God. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefit towards me and so on? You know, and God, God is amazing. And there, there are a number of Psalms that, that, that is so beautiful. The heavens declare the glory of God and affirm and okay, show it sure. his handiwork. Psalm 19. Those are some that you will remember from, from your Pathfinder days. Those were must know texts. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I'm just relaxing in, in the bed. I might have I have this thing where if I take just even a second nap in the day, sleep doesn't come easy in the night. And one of the one of the best things to do is to just reflect on a psalm. Just, just, just try to run them, you know, one after the other. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Amen. And you know, sadly, Pastor Joseph, we're out of time. You know, this is the shortest whispering hope we've had on a Friday. Surprisingly, yeah. but nonetheless, when we reflect on the topic for this week, a life of praise, the story of Paul and Silas stands out. Yes, we see Jehoshaphat. Yes, we see Joshua, but for me, in all of this presentation on the life of praise, this story found in Acts 16, 16 to 34, sums up this life of praise. You may ask why. Here are two men ministering for God, and this woman who's a fortune teller, you know, she's walking behind them, she's announcing who they are, and I don't know if they were grieve or they wanted to help her but whatever the situation is they released her of the demon and her owners were so angry that these guys were beaten and if that wasn't enough they were placed into prison and not just in but into the inner prison and they had stocks on their feet and you would say man that's a really bad situation that's some tough crucibles to be beaten so severely and on top of that thrown in prison must have been trying. But these men never stopped to focus on their pain. They focus on God. And so they began to praise God, singing all the wonderful songs of Zion and giving God praise in every situation. And at midnight, prison shook. There was an earthquake. 
And here is the guard, the jailer, who was supposed to be up guarding the prisoners, ready to take his life. What I find amazing, though, is that none of the prisoners escaped when they had the opportunity, which speaks to the positive influence that Paul and Silas, praise, and their life had on the entire prison to keep the prisoners inside and also to convert the jail officer who probably was the one who beat them so severely and their entire family. A life of praise is something that we practice every single day. We're not going to get it right, but we have to get to the point where we say, in spite of and despite of the circumstances surrounding us, that we're going to praise God. So if nothing else to remember this week, remember to get to the point where you praise God as a lifestyle. God bless, have a wonderful day, and happy Sabbath when it comes around.